Well, happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you who are Irish. And, well, we could all worship, you know, celebrate St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick was a pretty great guy. And also, I want to say um, a blessed and wonderful Women's History Month to all the women here. I'm going to say a lot more about that. It is also the second Sunday of Lent. So pastor had a hard time discussing, figuring out what he's going to preach about today. All right, so I'm going to go for two out of the three. So poor St. Patrick will have to wait till next year. <laughs> but today we're going to talk um, about a message that was inspired by Women's History Month. It's called The Woman at the Well, a meditation on an incredible woman for Women's History Month. The reason why Women's History Month is necessary is because to a great extent in this country, the contributions of women often are overlooked and downplayed. If you open a history book, you think that only men did anything of consequence. And we in the church should know better. We know that women are made in the image of God, that when God reflected his image, it was male and female in relationship. But there's a lot of man-made divisions that have come into play over the years that we as the church should repent of. And men who are here, we should actively repent of that and work against that. We may not have caused that. We have some great guys here in this church. And I thank you for that. Um, but we all can do more to dismantle the harm done to women and their place in our society. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, let's do a little bit better than that. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So one of the things that, one of the messages that has been given to women by the church and by our society is that we need to tame you, right? If you think about the image of June Cleaver, it was anything that the man said was fine. Her, her job was to support what the man said and to take care of the house and do the cleaning and do the taking care of the kids. But what her desires were, what her opinion was, those things were subjugated to the opinion of the man. Is that, is that an accurate representation of that point of view? And so that way of thinking has even infiltrated the church where there's some who preach that women are inherently subservient or secondary to men. And again, that goes against what we read in scripture. I want to talk about a woman who refused to be tamed and Jesus' response to her. She paid a steep price for violating the cultural norms of her day, but I want us to pay attention to her interaction with Jesus and see what that can say to us today. If you go with me to John 4, and we're going to, I was debating about whether or not to do this, but we're going to read the whole account. We're going to read all the way from verse 4 through verse 30, but we're going to take it a little bit at a time. And to make it go a little bit easier, because this is a lot of scripture to read, I would like to make this a little bit dramatic, if you will. A little bit dramatic. So I'm going to need someone to read the voice of Jesus. No one wants to say, yeah, I'll be Jesus. So maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should pick somebody. Uh, Elder Stephen, will you be Jesus for us? I just really like hearing him talk, so that's why I picked him. Would someone be the woman at the well for us? Who can be the woman at the well? Thank you, Drew. And I will be the narrator. So you two are just reading what's inside the quotes for your person. So just inside the quotes. And so I'll read all the other things that are outside the quotes. All right? And hopefully this will be a little fun. John chapter 4, we're going to read verses 4 through 12 first. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, How can you ask me for a drink? No, no. Uh -oh. you and you. I, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> this is verse 10. So Jesus answered her, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who is it that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Go ahead, Drew. Sir, uh, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. All right, let's go to the next section. John 4, verses 13 through 20. I need a new Samaritan woman, and I need a new Jesus. So who will be? I'm not volunteering for the Samaritan woman. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you could be our, our, new, our new Jesus. And who will be the Samaritan woman? Thank you, Miss Rosetta. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. She replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Okay, let's pause for a second so I can give you some context. This is one of the most extraordinary exchanges in the Gospels. There is so much going on here. And Elder Stephen and I just sitting at dinner yesterday we're talking about how rich this passage is. And if you don't understand a bit about Jewish culture, you'll, you'll miss it. So let me just try to fill in some of those gaps for you. First of all, men did not have casual conversations with women, especially a single man talking to a single woman. This was a big no-no. And on top of that, rabbis did not engage women on theological issues. Now, if you realize that, if you think through the stories contained in the Gospels, you'll realize how many times Jesus spoke to a woman directly and had a conversation with a woman, right? He, he was breaking all kinds of social norms and turning his society upside down. But yet, this conversation should not be happening. Absolutely not. On many different levels, it should not be happening. On top of that, um, this woman was a Samaritan. Some would say that Jesus should not even be there, should not even be in the entire region of Samaria. Many quote unquote good Jews when going from Galilee to Judea. So it's Galilee, Samaria, Judea. Instead of going straight through, we'll go around Samaria. In, well, <laughs> this is going into water. <laughs> Around Samaria. In order to get from point A to point B. Right? So, Jesus is already on shaky ground. 
On top of that, he sent his disciples to go get food. You're not supposed to get food. You're not supposed to stop in Samaria. All right, if you're going to go through, you're going to go through as fast as possible. All right, you're going to speed through there like I do through Delaware. I'm just kidding. Thank you. God bless anyone from Delaware. <laughs> I try to get through as quickly as possible to get out of there to civilization. Right? Um, so he, see, he tells his disciples to go get them food. So in order to get food, you've got to interact with people. So his disciples are already pretty uncomfortable about being there. On top of that, drawing water was seen as women's work. Women were the one that went to go fetch water. And because women were often isolated, they were often kept within their homes and doing things within the home, that gathering water was one of the few times where they could interact during the day with other people, with other women. So they would often go to get water at the same time in order to have some kind of social interaction. The most popular times to draw water were early in the morning and just before sunset. Why do you think? That's the cooler, coolest parts of the day. It is hot, people. It's hot in the Middle East. And what time of day was this woman going to draw water? Noon, the hottest part of the day. It's not unheard of, but it's uncommon. And she was there alone, correct? There was no other women there going. So she was socially isolated from other women. So the woman that Jesus meets is socially isolated, and we find out pretty soon why she has some promiscuity issues going on here Jesus makes a note that she's had five husbands and the person that she is currently with is not her husband we don't know if these are true husbands husbands that she's been married to or just men that she slept with and had relationships with or or what there's a few ways that a woman can have five husbands and it be okay with the law and okay with society, but I'm getting the impression here that there were some social norms that she was breaking, or else Jesus wouldn't have brought it up in this way. So she has some promiscuity issues, and she broke some norms, and it seems like she's being shunned for it. Now, both the Samaritan woman and the disciples were shocked that Jesus would even speak to this woman. She's even taken it back. She's like, you're talking to me? You're asking me for water? Right? Jesus should not, under the best circumstances, be talking to this woman. Now we know a bit about her past. Even more so, Jesus should not be talking to this woman. And what do they talk about? They talk about spiritual. So Jesus is contrasting the physical with the spiritual. For instance, the, she's talking about well water, and he starts talking about living water. And they have this back and forth about theological issues. G Jesus divi divinely discerns her story, but even then, she doesn't withdraw from the conversation. She doesn't walk away and say, how dare you? She deflects, don't get me wrong. She tries to change up the conversation and go in another direction, but she doesn't withdraw. She stays there continuing to talk. Now, from what I just described, what do you see about this woman? What, start, what images start to come up, and how do you see her? How do you see her? Yes, go ahead. I think the mere idea Jesus mentioned if she asked him for water, the water he would give her, she wouldn't have to go back by the well to, to, to draw water. I think it draw her attention that I want some of this water mm. because I think she was frustrated to be isolated from the women and 
in the heat of the day is no easy task. Yes, yes. She, she wanted some of that strange water. Yes, yes. There's a hunger and there was a desire inside her. She wanted something. Something was missing from her. Go ahead. I think she understood some things, but not anything. Yes, yes. And Jesus had to correct a lot of the things that she thought, but she had a desire to know things and she knew some things. What else? Yes, yes, wow, incredible. It's amazing. This is an incredible encounter where she encounters a man that knows her story, right? And, and, and knows the good and bad of it and lays her bare. That's why what comes next is just really, really incredible. I get excited. It's hard for me to be patient in my preaching because this, is, this story is just so amazing. Anything else? What, what else do you see about this woman? Yes, go ahead. Uh, another thing that struck me is this man at the well has no cup. He has no, no rope. No. What is he up to? Yes, yes. He's just hanging out by the well, right? So she can see he might be a sketchy guy. But um, <laughs> the way he starts talking changes that for her pretty quickly. Go ahead. Well, she was probably over the years looking for the right guy and she never found one. Yes. The right one. So she finally found the one in him. Yes. Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. You preach it. You preach it now, brother. She found the one in Jesus. Go ahead. So verse 20, I'm not quite clear on. Mm -hmm. She seems to know something about Jews and where you worship. Yes. And she references our ancestors worship on this mountain. Yes. But she said, you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Yes. So I'm a little confused on that. Word. Yes, so the, the belief, um, the, the Samaritans held Mount Gerizim, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, as the holy mountain. And that is based on some things that happened with the patriarchs. The, the Samaritan Bible, if you will, stops after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They do not follow the prophets or anything that or the histories or anything that came after that so they base everything on what the patriarchs did and so they hold Mount Gerizim as the holy mountain Jesus uh, the, the Jews they're down in Jerusalem right worshiping on another mountain and so there's this is part of the big conflict between Samaritans and Jews um, they really really disliked each other at this time um, Jews thought Samaritans were half-breeds, um, they were intermingled with Gentiles, um, and they believed that their faith was watered down. Um, Samaritans believed that Jews deviated from the original teachings that were in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And so there's this big disagreement about where to worship, how to worship, who's, what mountain is really sacred, who really has the scriptures, and, and it led to a lot of animosity. Yeah, so thank you for giving me a chance to clarify that. Anything else that you see about this woman? But I would say the fact that she asked that question or raises that is extraordinary. That's not a topic that women are supposed to talk about or even know about, really. They just know what their husband tells them. They're supposed to, their, their husband is supposed to tell them things at home and then they're just supposed to hold on to that, right? It's, it's not for them to go out and s discuss and debate with a rabbi. Go ahead. It also seems like, you know, to use a modern day uh, parallel, it's like there's two sort of like extremely different uh, political points of view in this country. It's like if you were in one and you walked up to the other and said, yeah, you believe this, and it, you know, it's sort of almost like asking for a flight. Yeah. It, well, when, when he laid her bare, she definitely was asking for a fight, right? She was trying to change the subject into something that is um, controversial so the focus would get off her. But we know Jesus, right? He's not going to let her off that easy, right? All right, so let's continue on. We're going to look at John 4, verses 21 through 30. 
I'm going to need a new Samaritan woman and a new Jesus. Please. Thank you, brother. You, you could be Jesus. And do we have a Samaritan woman? I saw you, Connie. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we start out with Jesus. The woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit of truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or, what are you, why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. <coughs> Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Glory to God. There's a lot in there that gets preached about true worshipers in spirit and in truth. I'm not going to take too much time, but just for the sake of clarification, who is the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. And, and he is the spirit. So when we're talking about worshiping God in spirit and in truth, we're talking about worship that is instructed by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're not just talking about amen as worship. We're talking about a life of worship. Everything you do, everything you say can give worship to God. And he, God is looking for people who allow the Holy Spirit to transform them from the inside into true worshipers, a life devoted to Christ. And so that's why Jesus is eradicating that argument. He's first saying, first of all, salvation is of the Jews. God has a story, and he's been working out a plan, and the, the story of salvation winds through the Jewish history. Right? So you don't really understand what you're saying because you're missing the interpretation of the prophets. You're missing lamentations. You're missing the song of songs. You're missing all these other pieces. But salvation is of the Jews. But, but get this, there's coming a time when even being a Jew isn't good enough. You can't just get in and be okay just by who you're born to. It's going to be that God is looking for people who will follow Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 So he's correcting her error there. But in doing so, he's still engaging her, isn't he? He didn't say, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. You leave these discussions to people like me. You're a woman. Did he say that? Did he rebuke her curiosity? He engaged her. He saw her as a human. He, he valued her. You see, I, I believe this woman is a woman who had these problems in society because she refused to be tamed. At best, at least rather, she is assertive. But I think she's a woman that had a hard time finding her place in society. She was looking for something, she needed something, and she wasn't going about it the right way because she had a need. But Jesus did not try to tame her in that moment. He tried to focus her. He's like, I'm not trying to make you different, but I'm going to ground you in a foundation that is true, right, and good. He's like, I'm going to give you better information. And then let you be you based on that. She was looking for something that she found in Christ. The reason that she came there was to get water to draw water. 
And what she encountered in Christ was so amazing and so fulfilling that she forgot that entire plan. She left behind her water pot. And she became someone who brought men to Christ. Do you understand that? She was going to give Jesus some water, but she ended up bringing people, lives, souls to Christ. There's something about the nature of Jesus that is so transformational that it makes fishermen stop being fishermen and become fishers of men. It, it, it changes a woman who is trying to get well water into one who has living water coming out of her. There's something about the nature of interacting with this man that is transformative. There's something about this man that causes us to forget our shame, to forget our anger, to forget our feelings of isolation and loneliness, to break free from our shackles. Because in that moment, that woman ran to the people that she was socially isolated from because the story was so good. It wasn't about her and her own pain anymore. It wasn't about her story anymore, it's about his. There's something about Jesus where I don't fully understand, but it's only him where we can forget all about ourselves and focus on him. And as we do that, we actually find ourselves. How does that happen, church? How is it that when we forget about ourselves and focus on him, we become the truest version of ourselves? Amen. If he was a selfish, self-centered God, he would eradicate our personality. As soon as we follow Christ, he just make us robots that uh, conform to his image. But does he do that? No, he, he takes all of what we are and he sanctifies it. Even our crazy senses of humor, our eccentricities, are jewels to him. They're precious. And he does not throw them out. He does not conform them, but he uses them for his purposes and for his glory. What an awesome, mighty God we serve. Sisters, women, because of your past, because of what men have said, because of how you've been treated, you may be here shackled in some way. You may have had someone in your life that tried to tame you and make you conform to their image for you. But I'm here to tell you today about this man named Jesus who wants to set you free. And the freedom that he brings is so powerful and so good that not only will you be set free, you'll have the ability to set others free. The woman, the Samaritan woman, she went and told her community in John 4.39, it tells us that many came to believe in Christ because of what she said. Many. They came to him and they heard what he had to say, and there began to be a, a following of Jesus in Samaria, Samaria that the disciples later, the apostles later, capitalized upon as they're spreading the gospel. And it started with this woman, this broken woman, this ostracized woman, this untamable woman at the well. What does God want to do in and through you? He won't tame you. He won't try to restrict you. He will not shackle you. He will set you free. 
This is the God that we serve. Church, I am so happy that Jesus is relevant even today, even now. When we put him at the center, he shows us all things and the ways in which we should be. I apologize if there's anything that fell short in this message in communicating the way in which God thinks about women and how he supports women. But the fact of the matter is we serve a great and almighty God who wants to eliminate sexism from our society. He wants to have us all um, see ourselves as beloved children of the Most High God, sitting at his table, his eternal table of justice and peace and love. I thank you and let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love, grace, and mercy, Lord God. We also thank you that you are a God who values us, who values our personalities, who loves us. And you don't tame us, Lord God, but you try to direct us, you try to focus us, you try to ground us in the truth. Lord, the, the story of the Samaritan woman is, is so powerful. It speaks so much to us, Lord God, and help us to continue to glean your truth from it, Lord. I pray that we all, as a church, as a congregation, and as part of the body of Christ, would do everything we can to repent of the times when our society tried to tame and, and restrict and shackle women, Lord God. Let us proclaim that as a new day of liberation in Christ. We thank you so much and we praise you in Jesus Christ's holy name.